rebuild a more stable uh, global financial system. Now, this global financial crisis has persisted since the summer of 2007. That's approximately 20 months. And it's now metamorphosed into a global recession. So I think it's essential to address these questions in a broad macroeconomic context. If we strip away the details, the basic picture is that during the credit boom of 2002 to 2007, residents of the United States and a number of other high-income countries borrowed heavily both to consume more and to invest more. And of course, the investment was unusually concentrated in residential uh, real estate construction. And simultaneously, banks in these countries borrowed more and lent more to expand their businesses and securitizations backed by residential mortgages, to do proprietary trading, to extend credit domestically and internationally. Then, with the onset of the crisis in the summer of 2007, household sectors in several advanced countries were left highly over leveraged. And simultaneously, with the collapse of the valuations of the complex structured credit products, particularly the ones that were backed by asset pools of uh, subprime residential mortgages, a number of large internationally active banks experienced serious deteriorations in their capital adequacy. So it became evident to, uh, that large banks, too, were over leveraged. And since late uh, 2007 or early 2008, households in the advanced countries have been trying to reduce that leverage, and they do that by reducing consumption relative to disposable income. And simultaneously, the banking sector and other financial institutions are continuing to deleverage to rebuild their capital adequacy. And of course, both these actions are essential to eventually restore financial stability, but both have the effect of depressing output and employment in the advanced countries, thus weakening their demand for goods and services and their demand for imports from the rest of the world. I think despite these adverse conditions, the Chinese authorities have thus far succeeded in expanding domestic investment in productive infrastructure and uh, encouraged other uh, domestic spending as a major offset to the weakening of global demand and demand for China's exports. So China's policy actions appear to be good, both for China itself and for the global economy. But the bottom line is that despite uh, China's welcome initiatives, the present global recession, because it starts with this intense uh, process of deleveraging in two major sectors, is likely to be more severe and more prolonged and more um, synchronized internationally than any recession since 1945. So the global recession then, I think, provides the adverse macroeconomic context in which financial institutions and investors have to address both um, systemic risks and counterparty risks. For the immediate future, I believe that both the authorities and private uh, financial market participants need to address essentially three key systemic risks. The first is continued substantial deleveraging by both households and banks in a, a, a large number of countries. The second is further episodes of stress in both market liquidity and funding liquidity in global financial markets. And the third is persisting weaknesses in certain important aspects of corporate risk management. And let me just say a few words about each. I think in their attempts, in the authorities' attempts to mitigate the heightened systemic risks from continued private sector deleveraging, governments and central banks 
really have little choice but to use their policy instruments to um, take on the leverage that is being shed by these other sectors. And of course they do so by broad-based taxpayer-funded uh, guarantee schemes for the liabilities of financial institutions and uh, capital injections to those institutions and by substantial debt finance fiscal stimulus. Now of course such actions are necessary but they will create fiscal risks of their own over the medium term. So in current circumstances all types of corporations and indeed I think also policymakers in many of the emerging market countries need to maintain very strong liquidity positions. They need to build up capital positions systematically and they need to be particularly uh, vigilant of their rollover or refinancing risks. And of course banks need to continue to build capital through retained earnings. They need to carefully manage their maturity transformation and to manage risk uh, closely. And to some degree, I think, the steeply sloped yield curves uh, that we have currently that are re the result of bringing monetary policy interest rates uh, to historically low levels in the advanced countries will help financial institutions to gradually rebuild capital over time um, through retained earnings. Although many financial institutions have taken steps to strengthen their risk management, I think there are at least two areas that still require uh, really the most further work. The first is credit underwriting and credit monitor monitoring. These still need to be strengthened in a large number of institutions. And secondly, I do believe that we need a fundamental restructuring of corporate remuneration systems. And we need to implement those so that the remuneration of risk-taking individuals and units in each financial institution is much better aligned than it has been in the past with the long-run risk-adjusted uh, profitability objectives of the institution. Now, there have been useful proposals in this area, for example, by the Institute of International Finance in July of last year, and more recently by the Financial Stability Board, recently renamed uh, Financial Stability Forum, and by the European Commission. But as yet, there isn't really a broad consensus, particularly at the international level, on how to uh, go forward to align compensation incentives with better, um, with better risk management. Well, so much for the, um, the near-term, the key near-term systemic risks. What are the key near-term challenges in the management of counterparty risk? I think the, the current crisis is demonstrating that not only private uh, financial sector institutions, but also the authorities need to be particularly vigilant to counterparty risks at this time. And let me just mention two types that I think are currently most important. First, of course, is the counterparty risk that is embedded in the complex structured credit products that are held widely throughout the global uh, financial system, though happily they appear to be of limited significance institutions here in China. These are the famous uh, toxic assets. I should tell you that they're now referred to as legacy assets in the United States. We don't call them toxic assets, but they're, the, they're still the same thing. And they're what's causing the major deadweight loss in the financial system at this time. Now the loss in value of these instruments, of course, is the main factor that's led to the severe capital deficiencies of many banks.